So thanks for everyone for joining us today. I'm just going to do an acknowledgement of country. So Yama Malia, Naya Gunigaba Gulbiai, Naya Bronwyn Cochran, Gunima Ngay, Gunima Gamilaroi Ngu. So what I just said there was, hello friends, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Bronwyn Cochran and I belong to my motherland, the Gamilaroi motherland. So as always, before we embark on this educational journey, as we sit around the digital campfire that exists in this space right now, let us acknowledge First Nations people and take a moment to pay our respects to the First Nations people upon whose land we are gathering on today to connect and learn. We acknowledge the deep wisdom, ancient cultures and custodianship that have flourished across these diverse landscapes for tens of thousands of years. We honour Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present, and those that are emerging as the stewards of this sacred land. I'd also like to acknowledge any First Nations people who are joining us today. Our stories are interwoven with the constellations that grace our night sky carrying the wisdom of ages. With gratitude, we recognise their enduring relationship with the land, sea and sky, a relationship that has shaped our spiritual beliefs, cultural practices and astronomical observations. As we gather here to explore Indigenous astronomy with Duane Hamacher, we stand on the shoulders of those who have guided us through the stars and embrace the cosmic teachings. May we listen, learn and grow in the spirit of reconciliation, acknowledging that the knowledge shared today is a testament to the deep bonds between humanity and the cosmos, nurturing by First Nations community since the beginning of time. So I'm super excited uh, to welcome you all to this webinar on Indigenous astronomy, a topic that holds a special place in my heart. So I'm Bronwyn Cochran, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I'm a proud Gamilaroi woman, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm the founder and executive director at Tipiac, which is a 100% owned and run Aboriginal business that helps educators embed authentically rich First Nations perspectives across all key learning areas. And as we delve into the captivating world of Indigenous astronomy today, guided by the expertise of the remarkable Duane Hamacher, it's my hope that this webinar will not only expand our understanding of the stars above, but also inspire meaningful connections between Indigenous knowledges and the broader context of human learning. So thank you for celebrating National Science Week with us. So I also extend that heartfelt welcome to this sacred digital fire where knowledge is going to be shared and our spirits nurtured. It is an honour to introduce Duane Amateur, Associ Associate Profe Professor of Cultural Astronomy and a trailblazer in celebrating the rich tapestry of Indigenous astronomy. We are honoured to introduce Duane, a multifaceted scholar whose expertise spans physics, astronomy and social sciences. Duane's journey has intertwined academic prowess with a profound commitment to preserving Indigenous astro astronomical knowledge. His accolades include an Australian Research Council DECRA Fellowship science communication endeavours and pivotal roles in cultural and archaeological associations. And of course, Duane's legacy extends from academia to doc documentaries and is the author of The First Astronomers and has had impact with global initiatives. So enriching our understanding of the cosmos and its deep connection to culture. As Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we walk hand in hand with our ancestors' wisdom 
And today, guided by Dwayne's expertise, we journey even deeper into our cosmic heritage. Our skies have whispered secrets to us for generations. And through Dwayne's insights, these whispers transform into stories of resilience, connection, and cultural continu continuousness. So in the spirit of unity and growth, let us embrace this webinar as a digital campfire where generations meet under the stars and let us and let the luminous wisdom of Duane illuminate our path ahead. So thank you, Duane, for joining us today. I will now hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Brahman, and thank you for the invitation to come speak to everybody today. I'm finally back from my my last year in Germany where I was in Heidelberg and I've been back in this seat for almost two weeks, two weeks as of tomorrow. But I'm very excited to come share with you some of the knowledge that's been passed um, to me by some elders, but talk more about the scope of the knowledge and what it actually means in terms of science, astrophysics, and how we can incorporate this into education. So I'm originally from the US. I always joke that I, I'm from a state of misery or the state of Missouri. Um, but I, I came to Australia 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago this semester as a study abroad student. And I'd always grown up with a fascination and an interest in astronomy and science, but also with cultures and traveling around the world. So when I was able to come to Australia for the first time 20 years ago, it was a life changing experience. And it was a life changing experience in ways I hadn't predicted. So I knew that I was going to have a good time as I hoped that I would have a good time and I certainly did it was a, a remarkable um, semester just four quick months that flew by in a heartbeat. But something happened during that experience that paved the way for me to to engage in all of this work over the years. And back in, in August of 2003 <laughs> 20 years ago flies by quickly. Um, Mars was at its closest approach to the Earth in about 60,000 years, so it was a great opportunity to go outside behind one of the telescopes and have a look at our nearby red neighbor. And it would look a little bit bigger and a tiny bit brighter than normal. Now, when I went to the observatory on the campus, I was at a university in Sydney, and I remember asking about some of the indigenous knowledge about astronomy. I, I knew absolutely nothing about it whatsoever. I knew nothing about Aboriginal cultures whatsoever. We were just talking about um, astronomy and I thought, well, I'm kind of curious what, what sorts of knowledge do Aboriginal people have about this? And the response I got was pretty disgusting, to say the least. It was incredibly dismissive and rude and offensive. And it really shocked me. I was just sort of like, well, what? What happened? What? I was with another student. And we sort of looked at each other like, what the hell did they just say? Like, we were really shocked by it. And, you know, that that led me on the path to where I am now. I'm back to the US and I came back a couple of years later because I was obsessed with coming back to Australia. And I've been here ever since then, since 2006. And in fact, um, was it last, last June and finally became a citizen. But when I moved back, I was working on a PhD in astrophysics. But this idea about astronomy and culture, this, this crossroads is something that had sparked an interest in me and I began trying to learn more about Aboriginal astronomy and whenever I looked around or asked people about it I got two very different responses if I asked somebody about Aboriginal astronomy it would be dismissive oh they're just some myths and legends they didn't really have anything just some stories but there's no real knowledge there I thought it's kind of weird okay and I would go and I would actually look into some of the knowledge that was published in books and journals and as a scientist, I could see, well, there's tons of astronomy here. There's tons of science here. Why is nobody acknowledging this? Does, does nobody realize it? I mean, surely people have to realize this. What, what is going on? What's the issue? And I became so obsessed with that idea that I left astrophysics and decided to pursue a PhD in indigenous studies on this topic. And that's what this whole talk is going to be about. So last 15 years of my career, uh, immersing myself into this world, coming in as an outsider, knowing absolutely nothing beforehand, uh, no positive or negative views, just knew nothing about it at all. 
And what I'm going to do today is talk about some examples of this, but I'm going to I'm going to focus on three themes that have come across with this work, um, not just in Australia, but around the world and share with you some of the stories of the people who've helped pioneer this work and who've helped direct me in my studies. Now, you notice on the, the subtitle here, it says how indigenous elders read the stars, not read the stars, which is difficult because they're spelled the same, but read the stars. And the reason I use read the stars is it's not read as in the past and that's gone now. It's still present. It's still contemporary. This knowledge is still thriving today. But of course, it is under pressure. It is under threat due to colonization, due to light pollution, due to all these factors. But it survived through now and it will continue to survive as long as we continue to learn from it. So in the work that I've been doing, three major themes come through in this. Um, on the left part of your screen, you'll see a woman. This is Professor Annette Lee. Annette Lee is a Lakota woman, an astrophysicist, and a professional artist. She's got a PhD in physics and she's got an MFA, Master of Fine Arts from Yale. Um, she is the director of Native Sky Watchers, which is a, an American First Nations uh, charity dedicated to understanding indigenous astronomy. And her communities are Dakota, Lakota, and Ojibwe. And she talks about, as do all of the elders, how everything on the land is reflected in the sky and everything in the sky is reflected on the land. Now, I'm not talking about this in some kind of strange astrological, you know, context. I'm talking about how everything that happens on the land is encoded into the stars. If you want to know how the seasons change, you look at the stars. If you want to see the passage of time, you look to the stars. If you want to navigate across land or sea, you look to the stars. If you want to have some kind of anchor point for understanding the behavior of plants or of animals or the, uh, the availability of certain plants, you can mark that out in the stars. If you want to have social lessons about all the social rules that are involved in day-to-day -day life, you encode that in narratives and put that in the stars. The stars tell you everything that is happening on the land. The second topic that comes up quite frequently is how you see in the middle picture here, this is a prof uh, photograph of Professor Martin Nakata. Professor Nakata is the first Torres Strait Islander to earn a PhD in Australia and is currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor Indigenous at JCU in Northern Queensland. And Professor Nakata brought me in to my first academic position at the University of New South Wales at the Nuragili Indigenous Centre. And he would tell me quite often, we are a people of culture, but we are also a people of science. And that was the reason he brought me in to work on this. He says, you're a scientist, that's why you're here. You understand astronomy and astrophysics, but you also at least have some basic knowledge about how First Nations people, how Indigenous people, how our people understand the sky. And you're going to be working between these two worlds. And no matter what anybody ever tells you, don't let them try to convince you otherwise that we are not a people of science. Of course, he didn't have to tell me that. I could already see that. That was the whole point behind it. But uh, Professor Nakata has been a, a phenomenal mentor this entire time for helping to pave the way. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is how astronomy is embedded in traditional knowledge. And the person on the far right is Uncle Alo Tapim. Uncle Alo was one of the senior elders on Mer. This is the small island in the far eastern Torres Strait, which is also the home of Eddie Kweki Mabo. And Uncle Alo, like all of the other elders across the country and around the world say, your ability to thrive depends on your ability to read the stars. So when I say read the stars, what I mean is your ability to observe and interpret all of the changes in the positions and properties of the stars, including the sun, moon, and planets, and understand what they mean. So properties might be, you know, how does their position change over time? Do they rise and set? I mean, we know they rise and set, but when do they do that? Where are they going to be throughout in the sky throughout different times of the year? Um, what kind of peculiar shapes or cycles does the sun or the moon go through or the planets? When do the stars rise and set? What about the changing properties of the stars? What about their color or their brightness or things of that nature? Everything in the sky has meaning if you know how to interpret and read that meaning. And that's what he's talking about when he says, read the stars, which of course 
is the title of the book, the subtitle of the book. So how is science embedded within indigenous knowledge? Well, in a lot of ways, but it's important to understand that indigenous knowledges and different indigenous ways of knowing are quite different to many Western ways of knowing. They have similarities and they have differences. And what I'm looking at primarily is where those two worlds come together. So when it comes to science and indigenous knowledges, it's just one of many layers of the knowledge systems. So that idea about science being understanding the world around us through observation, through deduction, through experimentation, figuring out how things are related together, and then giving it some kind of predictive purpose. I can use this knowledge to tell me something that's gonna happen in the future. And that's really at the core of what science is all about. So there are lots of different layers of knowledge within these traditional knowledge systems. What I'm gonna be doing is unpacking that layer of science and explaining a bit more what that means. It also brings in the topic of, well, how is this knowledge passed on? Um, today, you know, I'm, I'm teaching classes all week, uh, all semester. You know, I may be lecturing to students, but knowledge is, it's written down in books, it's published in journal papers. It's mostly through the written word. But as humans, we don't really deal with the written word as well as we might think that we do. We've always had systems of orality. And we've always had ways of being able to pass knowledge on through story, through song, through poetry, through dance. And to do that requires a tremendous degree of mental capacity for memorization. And that's something that we as humans possess um, in a really remarkable way. So this knowledge is passed down through oral traditions and it can be passed down for extremely long periods of time. In fact, if you go online today, we just released a paper, an article in the conversation and a press release um, just today, just this morning about Aboriginal stories from Tasmania that have been passed down for at least 12,000 years um, that have two different lines of evidence, one astronomical and one geological. So after this, go online and check that out. Now, we often think about astronomy in terms of stars and constellations. And of course, we we'll, can give endless examples of that. But I want to talk to you about something just slightly different, a little bit of a twist on that. So we think about constellations as a patch of the sky with bright stars where we can connect the dots to trace out a familiar pattern. And we find those in cultures all around the world, including here in Australia connect the dots, constellations for bright stars exist and are plentiful, particularly in the Torres Strait. But there's something unique with indigenous ways of looking at the sky that you find in Australia and around mostly the Southern Hemisphere. And that ties into the concept of dark constellations. These are constellations not traced out by the bright stars, but constellations traced out by the dark spaces between the stars. And one of the main reasons for that is almost all of these dark constellations are within the plane of the Milky Way. Now we all know the Earth is tilted on its axis by about 23 and a half degrees. That's why we have seasons when we're tilted towards the sun. When that hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, we have summer. And when it's tilted away, we have winter. We just kind of go back and forth around the sun. Now the south pole of the Earth is tilted towards the plane of the Milky Way. What that means is from the southern hemisphere, you can see the huge middle part of the galaxy stretching around. You can see the Magellanic clouds. There's a lot more to see in the southern skies than you have in the northern skies. So when you're looking at the skies from the southern hemisphere, you can see the bright Milky Way above. But it's so bright and so dark, relatively speaking, in the southern hemisphere that you can see all those dark spaces in the galaxy. Those dark spaces from a Western science perspective, are areas of cool gas and dust. It's not that it's void of stars, it's just sort of like smoke. It's kind of like it's blocking out the background stars. And within this plane of the Milky Way, you can see lots and lots of different dark constellations in these different patches of the sky. And many of them can overlap. You know, constellations, even star, star names, there can be more than one. Constellations can overlap. A particular star might have different names depending on the time of the year or the context in which you're talking about it. It's very much a Western situation where you delineate between the two. There can only be one name and one definitive boundary. 
But if you look carefully in this image, you'll see uh, right here is the, the Southern Cross. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. I hope you can. You can see the Southern Cross here, the Colsac Nebula, and the two pointer stars that point to the top of the Southern Cross. Of course, what you're looking at here is the Celestial Emu. The Celestial Emu is a motif that you see all around Australia. Um, it goes by many names, uh, Chingal in northwestern Victoria, uh, Gergerman um, in, in central New South Wales, uh, Gowergay. It goes by lots of different names, and there are lots of different stories about how the emu came to be in the sky. But what you find with almost all communities across the country is what the celestial emu tells you when you observe it throughout the night as the year progresses through its annual cycle. So this knowledge comes from your country, Bron, went up Gamilaroi uh, Uwaiwe in northern New South Wales. And a particular uh, elder, Uncle Gillar, has taught us how at uh, the time of day just after sunset, when the sun goes down and you can fully see darkness, you'll see the emu in the sky rising around April and May, completely above the horizon. And it's seen as a female, and she's running. The reason the female runs is she chases the males around during the mating season. She basically runs a circle around them. They mate, they build the nest, and she lays a clutch of eggs. And while I'm here thinking about it, I've actually got an emu egg right behind me. So one second. I hope it comes up and you can see it. Emu eggs are actually quite large. Um, they can hold anywhere from six to 12 chicken eggs, depending on how big it actually is. And it kind of looks a bit like space here. It's dark, it's got little white specks on it. And a lot of the traditions talk about the sun coming from an emu egg that exploded. Now, during a normal season, a female will lay a clutch of maybe a dozen emu eggs, maybe more, and can lay a few clutches in a year. So in one breeding cycle, one breeding season, she can lay up to 35 kilograms of these eggs. Now, after running around the chase of mate, laying all these eggs, producing them and laying them, she does not possess the energy to then sit on the eggs during the incubation cycle. That becomes the responsibility of the males. So just after sunset, come June and July, it's now seen as a male sitting on the nest. And he sits on that nest and does not leave for any reason except to protect the nest from predators. And he'll also stand up 15, 16 times a day to rotate the eggs as he sits on them. So now after sunset come June and July, we see it sort of horizontally across the southern part of the sky. Now the incubation cycle lasts about 58, 59 days, just about two months. So right come out of the breeding season, right now is when you're going to start having those males sitting on the nest. And that early part of the breeding season up until the early parts of June is when Aboriginal people in many places would begin going out and collecting emu eggs. And the way to do that is to take a small, to get two groups of people, opposite sides of where the emu is, and you would take an emu collar, which looks like a tiny didgeridoo. And you take the palm of your hand and you hit the end of it. And when you hit it, it makes that guttural thumping sound that the emus make. If you've heard an emu in real life, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So one group over here hits the emu collar. The emu, think, thinking that it's a predator, gets up to go pursue them. And they distract the emu while the other people come in and will grab one, maybe two eggs. Almost never more than that, because if you take too many eggs, it's not going to be sustainable. You're not going to be able to keep the generations going. Now come August and September, the Milky Way swings around, and now, just after sunset, it appears to the southwest to be perpendicular to the horizon. Now, this is now seen as a male emu who's getting up off of the nest. The reason he's getting off of the nest, of course, is because the chicks are beginning to hatch. It is his responsibility, then, to help rear or brood the young. And even some of the initiation ceremonies that were held at this time of the year, some of those Bora ceremonies, the Bora ground, which is two circles connected by a pathway, are oriented to the position of the Milky Way because it's seen as a reflection of the Milky Way in the sky. 
And the boars in the sky are the same part of the sky where you see the celestial emu. And the symbolism of the emus bringing the chicks into adulthood is the same as the senior elders bringing the youth into adulthood. And then you come a couple of months later, you come around to November and December. And what happens now is even though the Milky Way keeps swinging down and it, it kind of looks like the emu is lying on the horizon on its back, the elders say, well, at this time of the year, it's seen as an emu sitting in a water hole. Because as the weather starts to warm up and get hot, the emus will cool off by sitting in water holes. And when they do that, they sit in the water hole. And like a celestial Archimedes, it displaces the water, which then falls out of the sky onto the land, creating a peak in annual rainfall. You can see that quite clearly in the image there, that histogram of rainfall showing how it peaks in November and December. I think I took that data from the uh, BLM from around Lightning Ridge, and it shows that beautifully. So you can see from the celestial emu in the sky how the position of the emu in the Milky Way just after sunset throughout the year can tell you about changing seasons, can tell you about the behavior of the emu, can tell you about food economics, when to go collect these eggs, can tell you about rainfall, could even tell you about ceremony. And that's just the very base levels of knowledge. It goes much deeper than that. But you can see how much complexity is wrapped into something that to the untrained eye might just seem kind of neat. But no, there's actually a lot of science behind that. And it's also worth noting that if you were to go to South America, for example, there's also a large flightless bird called the Rhea. And Tupi, Quechua, um, Chaco peoples all around the region from the Amazon down through Argentina have very similar traditions about their bird, which is the exact same shape as the emu. It's the ray in the sky. So you can see these remarkable similarities by different cultures completely around the world. Now, an exciting area of research that I've been involved in over the years deals with the topic of sunspots and aurora. And this is something that I that I really like because this is going to give an example of how traditional knowledge is actually informing and guiding modern Western science. Now, the idea that you can see dark spots in the sun has not been known in terms of the history of science for all that long. It's only credited as being fairly recent discovery in the last few hundred years that you would notice these dark spots in the sun. Now, the question arises, well, did indigenous cultures know about sunspots? I mean, the sun is so bright, how would you know? Well, curiously, there are cultures around the world that talk about dark spots in the sun. And one example is the Zambezi people from Africa who talk about the sun being a man who's adorned these beautiful glowing feathers. And the moon is a woman who becomes very envious of him. And she sort of tries to pursue him around the sky and every once in a while she becomes really jealous of him and she tries to take away some of those feathers when he's not paying attention and when she does that he gets angry at her and he throws mud on her and she retaliates by throwing mud on him now when he throws mud on her as a retaliation for trying to steal his feathers that's what darkens the moon down that's why the moon is not as bright as the sun and also talks about those Maria, those dark patches on the moon. And she gets angry at him and she sort of reacts by throwing mud at him. Sometimes it sticks, but he doesn't get too bothered by it because it's not very much. And it only happens once every 10 years or so. Now, what's interesting about that, it's a solar cycle. When you get the appearances of these sunspots, that's on a 10 to 11 year cycle. Now, when I was in, northern Thailand with Lana communities north of Chiang Mai, they were talking to me about something similar and they talked about eclipses, which maybe we'll have time to get into today, I'm not sure. And I asked them, I said, well, how do you observe that without hurting your eyes? And they said, well, what we do is we'll take a piece of wood, we'll put some dried coconut grass on top, and then we'll light it on fire. And the smoke that comes off of that is very dark and you hold it up to the sun and you can actually look through that, through the sun, through the smoke, and it blocks out the home for rays of light. So you can see things like that, which is quite a remarkable way of doing it. 
Now in Southern Sydney, the Darawa people uh, talk about one of the cycles, sort of a seasonal cycle they have that isn't annual, it's sort of decadal. It takes once every 10 to 11 years to go through a full cycle. And this Mudong cycle describes changes in the local environment, drought periods, it seems to be discussing um, La Nina and El Nino. But it seems to follow the solar cycle, but not just ca not, not caused by the appearance of sunspots, but by the appearance of aurora. And I'll say how if you look to the south and the southwest, you can see aurora in the sky, and that kicks off the start of the next Mudong cycle. But in particular, you look at aurora at a certain time of the year, and they really focus on looking at that around September and October. Now, what's interesting about this is you can see aurora from latitudes as far north as Sydney. In fact, southeast Queensland and Uluru, the Northern Territory, have traditions about aurora appearing in the sky and Aboriginal traditions. So there's a connection, of course, between sunspots and aurora. When you have an increase in sunspots, it sends more of those charged particles towards the Earth, which get channeled by the Earth's magnetic field towards the poles into these big sort of rings that go around the, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle, roughly. And when those charged particles hit the particles in our upper atmosphere, they ionize, they jump energy states, and when they do that, they release light, which we can see as the aurora. So a little bit of physics here. And of course, the color of the aurora depend on whether it's oxygen or nitrogen changing states. It's those kinds of effects. But what's interesting is that you get an increase in aurora, not only every 10 to 11 years, but at a certain time of the year. Auroras are more vivid, uh, they're more abundant, they can be seen from higher latitudes, closer to the equator or lower latitudes if you're in the north. And this tends to happen around the equinoxes, when the equatorial plane of the earth is in line with the plane between the earth and the sun, the ecliptic. And what happens here is those two planes, because they're together, the magnetic field of the sun, and the magnetic field of the earth, they kind of cancel out each other a little bit, not completely, but they, they do work against each other. And that allows more particles to go in towards the poles. Now, this is a phenomenon that was not described in Western science until the 1970s uh, by two geoscientists, um, solar geoscientists named Russell and McFerrin. So now it's called the Russell McFerrin effect where the Earth and the Sun coming together in that same plane around the equinoxes causes more intense aurora. So that's something that was known by Darawal people long before it was known in Western science. But curiously, one of the more fascinating bits of information about how traditional knowledge can inform modern Western science comes not with the appearance of aurora, but the sound of aurora. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, how can light make sound? Light doesn't make sound. Well, you might be surprised. When I began doing research on indigenous astronomy, I wrote a whole paper on aurora and Aboriginal traditions because the whole southern half of the continent described Aboriginal stories and accounts and, and reactions to aurora and, and their, how this sort of phenomena tied into their knowledge systems. And so many of them talked about aurora making sound, this really weird kind of crackling, hissing, popping sound like, um, you know, wadding up paper or even cracking your knuckles or rustling grass, this kind of weird poppy, staticky kind of sound. Um, Maori traditions in Aotearoa, New Zealand described this. And when I looked at northern cultures, the Inuit and the northern Dine up in, you know, Alaska and the northern part of Canada also talked about aurora making sound. They even said when aurora more brilliant, the sound is more intense, showing a direct relationship. And if you look at the far northern part of Europe, um, the Sami people, the northern part of Scandinavia and Finland and Peninsula Russia, their name for the aurora is what you can see here. It actually means the light you can hear. Now, what's interesting is I'm going to play you a little video of aurora making sound. If it works for me, let's hope it does.
So you can really tell that that weird kind of crackling popping sound I was describing before. Now, what's interesting about this is that it was only maybe 20 years ago that a Finnish physicist was with some friends at a jazz festival in the northern part of Finland. And it, they, want, they were outside one evening and it had snowed. It was incredibly cold, I think 30 degrees below zero. And they wanted to, they, they could see a bright aurora in the sky and they just wanted to see what it would be like. And they were so mesmerized by the aurora and it was so quiet that they started noticing this weird popping, crackling, hissing sound. And they were like, wait a minute, is, is that caused by the aurora? They're like, no, no way, that can't be. But it was quite a fascinating event for them. And they began learning more about indigenous knowledge is talking about aurora making sound. And he's, he got, became completely obsessed with this. Uh, Lane Utma, I think is his name. I forget the name off the top of my head exactly. Uh, but he became quite obsessed with this. And he ran a whole bunch of experiments. Um, and just in the last few years, he began publishing them, showing a physical explanation for that. And, and to make a, a long, detailed story of physics very simple, what happens in the right kinds of conditions outside um, they basically cause a static charge at the ground level, sort of like static electricity you build up in your feet. And sometimes when you get this weird temperature inversion where the temperature goes up as you go higher, it can discharge and sort of give off that popping sound. So if you've ever heard yourself get shocked when you touch something metal after walking on carpet, it's kind of similar to that. And that popping sound is caused by the aurora. So in a weird way, lights can make sound. Just Maybe not the way you thought they would. Now I want to get into a couple of other examples. So we talked a little bit about a dark constellation. We talked about the sun uh, and how it ties into Aurora. Let's talk a little bit about the moon. Now there's so many different things I could speak to you about. I'm not going to have time to go into much, but what I do want to do is talk to you about something quite interesting that I only got into researching a few years ago. I imagine everybody has seen a crescent moon, right? Uh, one of the things I noticed about it, sometimes a crescent moon will appear to be like a bowl on the ground with those points or the cusps pointing straight up. Now, when I was younger, I was referred to that as the Cheshire Grin. For those of you who may remember um, Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire cat would sort of disappear or appear. And usually the first or the last thing you would see would be its smile, its big toothy smile. Now, what's interesting is if you pay attention to the moon throughout the year, you'll notice sometimes the moon appears at different angles. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two artworks. These are both by Uncle Seagar Passy. Uh, that, that slide you saw at the very beginning with the title, that was one of his artworks. He's a, a senior He's the senior elder on Mare in, in the Eastern Torres Strait. He's in his 80s, and he is a national icon and world famous artist. I'm going to show you two different paintings of the moon that at first glance might look nearly identical. But when you look closely, you notice a lot of things different about them. So look carefully, and what do you notice that's different about them? Perhaps you'll notice that the clouds in the background are different you'll notice that the ocean looks different. The reflection of the moonlight in the water looks different. The shades of light in the sky around the moon look different. And of course, you'll notice that the moon is tilted at two different angles. So lots of details if you look at the moon. Now he told me that the moon appears in one orientation during the wet season and one orientation during the dry season. And initially I thought, well, of course, this looks to me like it'd be the wet season. You've got these big cumulonimbus rain clouds. The water looks very choppy. That must be the wet season. And here the water looks pretty calm. You can see a clear reflection of the moonlight. If you see those thin cirrus clouds, this must be the dry season. And he sort of smiled, he looked down, he shaked his head, and he says, you've got it exactly backwards. He says, it's not what you have right now. It's when you look in the sky and you see this image, it's going to tell you about the weather tomorrow because you get different trade winds. You get southeasterly trade winds in the, in the summer, in the 
sorry, the winter time, the sag air, and you get the wetter northwesterly winds and the cookie, the monsoon season. And this is actually what you will see in the monsoon season. And this is what you'll see in the dry season. It tells you about the weather you're going to have tomorrow. And this one in particular, if you look at those thin cirrus clouds, those types of clouds tend to form in low fronts. Low fronts bring rain. So you might be surprised to look at that and realize there are two different times of the month. They're kind of opposite to what you might normally think. But it's also a good way of showing that indigenous art, regardless of the medium, is about conveying knowledge. And in these two artworks, every brush stroke, every color, every texture has purpose and it has meaning and is conveying knowledge. Now, one of the other things that is quite fascinating is on the topic of eclipses. I'm not sure who here has managed to see an eclipse, whether it's a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, like I've shown here, but these are pretty rare phenomena. I mean, lunar eclipses aren't too bad. You can see them every couple of years, two or three years, depending, but solar eclipses are incredibly rare. Solar eclipses only occur from any given location on the Earth, maybe once every three or four hundred years. And that that period of totality when the moon completely covers the sun, if it happens to cover it, it doesn't always do that. But if it does, it never lasts more than seven minutes. Usually it's just a few minutes. Now, you might think because of that, that solar eclipses would be incredibly rare in traditional knowledges. I mean, something that you can hardly ever see only for a few minutes and only comes by every few hundred years. I mean, are you going to have knowledge about that? Yes, you have tons of traditions all around Australia and around the world about how these eclipses form and what they mean. And most of these traditions talk about it being the moon moving in front of the sun. Now, most of us know that because we've learned it, but, you know, by reading books in science class. But if you're looking up at the sky, this kind of eclipse occurs during a new moon, but you can't see the moon. For three days during the lunar cycle, you cannot see the moon. That's when it's between us and the sun. Usually it's not directly between us, it's off to the side, but we just can't see it. We're seeing the, 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 the unlit side, literally the dark side of the moon is what we're seeing at that point. Even though it's the same face of the moon, the other side's being illuminated by the sun. So you have to know exactly where the moon is in the sky as it's moving around to know that's the moon moving in front of the sun. And that takes, really careful attention being paid to the stars. Now, because I don't have too much longer to talk about that, I'm not going to go into much more detail about solar eclipses. But if you want to learn more about this, this is a section of a story that was shared by Uncle Gillar Michael Anderson, the same elder that I spoke about before with regard to the celestial emu. And he decided to share knowledge for the very first time, never before published, in this book called Eclipse Chasers by Nick Lohm and Toner Stevenson. And a few of us have contributed different chapters in this. Uncle Gillar and myself wrote chapter two, which is about First Nations views of the eclipses here in Australia. So you can go and find brand new knowledge shared in some depth in chapter two of this book. Now, what might surprise some people is to know there is a ceremony in the Torres Strait that is only performed during a total lunar eclipse. And that ceremony is planned months in advance. Now, if you don't know much about the history and philosophy of science, maybe it doesn't matter. You're like, yeah, okay, so what? Well, nowhere in the history of science is credit given to an oral culture for being able to predict eclipses. The only evidence we have of cultures being able to predict eclipses is ones that have detailed written records whether it's the Maya who record them on the Stella, whether it's the ancient Sumerians and Babylonians who recorded them in tablets or the Egyptians. Credit for being able to predict eclipses has never been given to an oral culture. And yet, in the Torah Strait, there's this special ceremony. It's, there's a special dari, there's a whole dance and song that goes along with this. This has a whole huge, deep, layered uh, levels of meaning. And this goes way before colonization. This is not something that, that just popped up fairly recently. Um, this is an old traditional cop car or sacred dance. And again, it only takes place during a lunar eclipse. And this eclipse is planned months in advance, which means that the traditional astronomers who are called Zugubo Mabaig have to be able to know when these are going to occur. 
And they apparently had that capacity because they have these ceremonies. What technique was used? Was it eclipse seasons? Was it uh, calculating the zero cycle? I'm not sure, but I'm gonna be working with elders to try to figure out exactly how that was done because it is quite remarkable. Now, the very last thing I wanna talk about before we run out of time is the topic of variable stars. What do I mean when I say variable stars? Something about the changing property of these stars that is quite significant and changed the history of science just in the last few years. Now, there are a few examples of this, but I'm going to talk to you about one today. This is about the tradition of Wayangari. Wayangari um, was a young male initiate, mid teens, mid to late teens. Wayangari literally means red man. The reason it means red man, during this period of time, um, through his initiation, Wayangari had to prove himself. And to prove himself, one of the things he had to do was go a period of time, I think it's about a week, week and a half, with no food, no clothing, no contact with anybody else, and he was covered full body in red ochre. Now, the very strict uh, laws about this period where he's Narambi during this very sacred time. Um, this knowledge comes from the Narendri people of the Kurong down south of Adelaide on the coast. And there are lots of different variations of the Wayangari story, but they all have the same general theme. Um, Wayangari broke a sacred taboo. He did something he wasn't supposed to, and that was something that involved two other women. Now, they all three were going to face death as punishment for breaking traditional law. So to escape death, Wayangari cast a spear into the Milky Way he pulled himself up into the Milky Way, and then he pulled the two women up. And then after the three of them were up there, he pulled up his canoe. Now, Wyangari, the two women, are both sitting in the celestial canoe in the Milky Way with the celestial emu off to the west. And every year, just after sunset, you will see these stars directly overhead. And that tells you that winter is going, what we think of as spring is coming in, uh, the animals are coming out and about, life is sort of rejuvenating, rejuvenating, coming out of that cold, dark winter period. Now, you can tell the seasons by these stars being high in the sky, but also every few years, every once in a while, Wyangari will get hotter and brighter. And this signifies to the people the importance to obey traditional law. It's, it's reflecting the sacred taboo that he broke. Now, what's interesting about this is when these stories were recorded back in the 1800s, um, some anthropologists were trying to interpret what this meant and try to figure out what the people were talking about. Now, because he's bright red, a lot of the anthropologists thought, well, it must be talking about the planet Mars. It's bright red. It's in the sky. Well, that makes sense. And sometimes Mars is close to us in the solar system. Sometimes it's further away. So it would change in brightness. That means sometimes it appears a bit hotter. And sometimes it appears a bit fainter. Now, this was recorded in the academic literature and books and all kinds of things for 150 years. And it was just a few years ago that a colleague of mine sent me a paper that he had written about all these different variations of the Wyangari story. And he said, Dwayne, I want you to read this. I'm not sure if Wyangari is Mars. I want you to tell me what you think. As an astronomer, what do you think? And I looked at it and immediately I knew it can't be Mars. Why? Because Mars is a planet. It's a wanderer. It's always moving around. It's not going to be in the Milky Way all the time. It's not going to be high in the sky after sunset in the spring every year. Um, and it's not always going to be near two stars. So it talks about Wyangari being a star and the two women on either side of him. It doesn't make any sense. It can't be Mars. And even if you go into museums and, and bookshops in some places, you can see this narrative, this story here, this, these kinds of artworks on uh, coffee mugs, on neckties, on all kinds of merchandise. And you read the tag, it talks about it being Mars, but it's not Mars. That was a mistake of the anthropologist. It's very clearly the star Antares. Everything fits with this perfectly. 
Scorpius is a celestial canoe. You see that all around the South Pacific and the top part of Australia and the Torres Strait. This is the canoe of, of Tagai. The two stars on either side of Antares, Tau and Sigma Scorpii, perfect orientation for the women. In fact, if you look at his artwork, you see how they're kind of not in the perfect alignment. They're kind of off a little bit. It's exactly how you see them in the sky. Everything fits. The celestial emu is just off to the west. In fact, Scorpius is in the body of the emu. So everything here fits. But what about this changing in brightness? What are we talking about here? Well, Antares is a super giant red star that pulsates slowly over time. And when it pulsates and gets bigger, it literally gets hotter and brighter. And when it contracts a little bit, it gets a bit cooler and a little bit smaller. This pulsation in this red giant star is part of the physical structure of it. That period between being hot and then going faint and coming back to the same brightness again is about four and a half years. So every four and a half years, it goes from being brighter to fading by almost one and a half magnitudes and then coming back to being bright again. It changes noticeably if you're paying close enough attention. Now, in modern uh, Western science, the variability of these supergiant red stars was not known until about 1840 by John Herschel observing stars off the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. So if astronomers had been looking at these traditions and not thinking, oh, they're just myths and legends. No, they're oral narratives meant to pass down knowledge in a memorable way. Um, they would have noticed these stars changing in brightness and been able to realize that these stars do change in brightness. And that opened up a whole new branch of astrophysics and stellar astrophysics. And also because that same technique is used about changing brightness of stars to help find some planets. So we can see a few examples here about how traditional knowledge of the sun, the moon, the stars, even Aurora can tell you important things about the world around us, how that knowledge was embedded within indigenous knowledge systems, how in some cases that knowledge was passed on in narratives and song and dance, but also how it's helping to reshape what we know about modern science and how it is actually informing current research in physics and astronomy. So I'm sorry I don't have time to go into everything else right now. If you want to learn more and see what all these awesome slides are about, please grab a copy of the book, The First Astronomers. Um, I've gone in th through this book chapter by chapter talking about all these different topics and these different ideas. This book was co-authored by six elders. I've spoken about a few of them in here. And 100% of author royalties of this book go to a charity that I founded um, for the money to go back into the community, to go into education projects, scholarships for First Nations students. I don't personally see a single dime from this book. Um, despite all the money this book has made, I've never gotten a dollar from it. It all goes to the charity. So please grab a copy of it. You can get it in paperback, an ebook, or an audiobook that is narrated by Adam Sims. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So before we um, end out this webinar, we're just going to open up for, and I know we've got around five to 10 minutes. I don't want to keep you too long, but um, let's open it up to some questions. So if you've got a question, uh, if you could just pop it into the um, Q&A section and I will read it. So there is a Question. Yes, it will. It is recorded, and um, we will send out a, an email to everyone that's uh, signed up for today, and it'll go up on our Tip Tipiac YouTube channel. Um, and so there, there's a question from Mark. Now, what I might do, Mark. Uh, so. Mark says, hi, Duane, excellent presentation. Does this book have a chapter on comets or impact events? Hi, Mark, it's good to hear from you again. Um, the last chapter is called The Falling Stars. All the chapters have star themes, the variable stars, twinkling stars, seasonal stars, navigational stars. The very last one is called The Falling Stars. Um, it's about meteors. Uh, meteorites impacts. There's not much on comets in here. I kind of couldn't get to everything in the book and it was kind of weird trying to fit that one in. So I mentioned comets somewhere in here. I forget exactly where, 
but um, that last chapter is called The Falling Stars, and it's mostly about meteors and some of the impact craters like um, Wolf Creek Crater or Gondomalal, Henbury, uh, Norilar, Goss's Bluff Crater, and some of those in there. Um, I am currently working on that, which you've been asking about, and we'll be able to get more information to you in the near future. But I did write a paper on comets and Aboriginal traditions, which you can find on our website, which is aboriginalastronomy.com.au. So if we go to, to research, and on that you'll see a tab that has papers, and it'll be listed in there. Great. And there's another question. Um, can you please share the Tasmanian story article from today? What was the paper again? I can't seem to find it. Um, I will have to log off here to, to, to grab that because we're all sharing screens right now. But if you just go and look um, Tasmanian oral tradition, put that into Google right now, and it should bring up the conversation article, which links into the paper I published and everything else. It just came out today, this morning. Amazing. And another anonymous attendee has a comment, brilliant, concise about such broad um, immensity. Great work, Dwayne. Thank you. And then another one from Flick. No question, just thanks. This is the fourth time I've heard Dwayne speak now, and I've always and I always learn so many new things each time. Uh, thank you so much. I try to talk about something a little bit different each time. So you'll probably hear some of the same stuff, but I try to throw new bits of information in there every once in a while. And this one's from Charmaine. Will Duane be offering a course here in Australia, in Melbourne, anytime soon? Yes, it's already in the running. So first semester of every year, I teach a gen ed or a breadth subject called Indigenous Astronomy. Uh, it's through the School of Physics, but it's not physics intense. You know, you've got about as much physics in here today as I give my class. It's a first year subject, but we go into all of this in depth. In fact, each chapter in the book, we spend a whole week going into, deep diving into. And I get lots of um, First Nations guests from around the world to come in and give guest lectures. Uh, second semester of every year, I teach archaeoastronomy, which I'm doing right now, which isn't purely focused on Australia, but includes Australian content. And then, of course, in the third semester, or I'm sorry, um, third year, another breadth or gen ed subject. I'm starting to teach this in December for the very first time. It's a very intensive two week summer intensive, the first two weeks of December, called Safeguarding Dark Skies. And it's all about the importance of overcoming light pollution and how light pollution impacts astronomy, ecology, and human health, and how we can help overcome that through programs in engineering, architecture, and design. Great. And Mark says, thanks, he's going to buy it right now. <laughs> and then there's another anonymous um, comment here. Your book is amazing, Duane. I have lived in various areas of Victoria, the north being the most clearest in the sky. And another one, found the article. Thank you so much. I love learning about this. As we all do, it's been fantastic. And I've taken away so much knowledge today. And um, again, Duane, I really appreciate your time today. And I will uh, send out a follow-up um, email to everybody that's um, joined us today and to those that have. Actually, there's a few more. I think just, just having a quick look at some of the comments, um, all the courses that I'm teaching are here at the University of Melbourne. Um, we do take outside students, so outside students can enroll. I understand, you know, I don't set the university fees. The courses are very expensive, as most of the universities are. But if you're enrolled in a program at a different university, you can enroll as an outside student and take some of these courses. If you want to learn more, you can follow Australian Indigenous Astronomy on um, Facebook. I've also got a, a Facebook professional account under Dr. Dwayne Homacher. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram. Uh, you can go to the firstastronomers.com. We've got social media attached to the book. But also the main thing is, is our website, which is aboriginalastronomy.com.au. We're building a new website and hoping to switch it over by the end of the year. The one we've got up is a little bit archaic, but we're getting there. So go check that out. You can see us on a lot of different social media platforms. 
Um, but just give us a quick little Google and you'll you'll find us online. Mm -hmm. And I'll also, um, when I put this video up on our YouTube channel, Dwayne and I will list all of those on there as well as um, list all of those social media and your website and the link to where they can purchase the book um, on the follow-up email. That sounds amazing. And it's great to, to see that the national curriculum, we're developing all these modules of knowledge um, What just happened there? I think we... Ron Lynn, and thank you everybody for coming and joining today. Yes, thank you so much again. And thanks everyone. Thanks, Dwayne. I'll be in touch. Here, sounds great. Thanks. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.